Many thanks for inviting me to take part in this symposium. I'm very sorry I can't be there with you today, but I'm incredibly busy at the moment for reasons that will become clear shortly. As I'm not there, I can't judge the tone of the other presentations, so I hope this isn't completely wayward. It's also more autobiographical than normal, which I hope you'll forgive. So between around 1994 and 2003, I organised exhibitions of contemporary art. In 1998, together with Hans Ulrich Obrist and, and a Swedish curator called Maria Lind, I set up a project space called Salon 3 in the Elephant and Castle shopping centre in South London. Our idea was to offer something a bit more international than the jingoistic young British artist scene that was prevalent at the time. In 2000, I was appointed as a curator at the Nordic Institute for Contemporary Art, and I had responsibility for working with visual artists across Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden and Iceland. On September the 11th, 2001, I was on a small island just outside Helsinki when the Twin Towers was attacked. And I watched from a distance the US and UK response to this, which led to the invasion of Af Afghanistan. At the same time, I was stunned by the silence of the artistic community and began to lose faith in the power of the arts to comment politically on the world. At the time, I was already overseeing projects in Scotland and Ireland as part of a bilateral exchange between the UK and the Nordic countries. And I moved to Glasgow around 2002 to continue working on exhibitions there. I curated my last exhibition at Apex Art in New York in 2003, less than a mile away from the former World Trade Centre. And the theme for the exhibition was the disinformation that was being fed to the American public through the media primarily. So while I was in Glasgow, I began to develop my research at that side of my practice. I also wrote a terrible novella, which thankfully never saw the light of day. And I became aware of the critical social research that was going on at the Department of Geography and Sociology at the University of Strathclyde. I signed up for an MRES there in 2007 and began to learn investigative research methods. I interrogated the formation of Culture and Sport Glasgow, which uh, turned into Glasgow Life. And I also undertook uh, an investigation of the privatisation of the Royal Mail and the market forces behind that. At the same time, I noticed that the art world had become very commercialised. There was a very big market for the kind of work being made by the YBA artists, and something similar was happening in Scotland. The arts councils, which had been set up just after World War II, to act in parallel to the market, were actually dovetailing with the market, and particularly Arts Council England was championing the success of the art market. I became disturbed by this and start to look, started to look around for alternative ways of valuing culture in terms of individual and social benefits. Purely on a hunch, I imagined that in Cuba things had been done differently. Um, so I signed up for a PhD at Strathclyde and started to explore this proposition. As a note to self, if you're going to uh, undertake research in another country, it's always worth knowing how to speak the language of that country. So I didn't speak a word of Spanish and ended up uh, in, in Cuba for five months, the first three months of which I spent every morning at the University of Havana trying to grasp the Spanish language. While I was in Cuba, I managed to get access to lots of documentation in libraries and archives, and the most I could do really was to make copies of it to bring home and try and translate with the aid of a dictionary. What I found in Cuba was, uh, well, an increased understanding of the revolution. Just to recap, for those of you who don't know very much about the Cuban revolution, in 1953, uh, a group of disgruntled, primarily university students, were um, rose up against the military coup, the di dictatorship that was in place, um, and started to attack military barracks, which ended in complete disaster. Um, the band of merry men was led by Fidel Castro, who was imprisoned in uh, on an island off Cuba for his troubles, and eventually exiled to Mexico. It was there that he met Ernesto Che Guevara, and they started to plan the, the Cuban revolution. They hired a very small motor cruiser, and 80 or so people sailed back to Cuba, to the southeastern tip of the island, in 1956, and conducted a two-year insurrection, which eventually led to a, a victory march into Havana by uh, what was called the 26th of July movement, in honour of the, the uh, anniversary of their first attacks on the military barracks.
when they were in power, the revolutionary um, leadership instigated a, a very um, comprehensive program of redistribution of land and wealth. And they made health, education and culture the three pillars of the, of the revolution. There was a clear understanding that the educational and cultural level of the population was too low to um, enable any kind of development, not, not least economic development. The, uh, pr prior to the revolution, the um, society had been very elitist and only a small proportion of people had access to education, culture or health. And so the revolutionary leadership changed all of that. One of the first things that they did was they restored the museum collections, which had been collecting dust, particularly in Havana. Uh, they started to tour artworks around the island, giving the people back access to their cultural artefacts. Um, they opened up theatres and made um, theatre and ballet and uh, the performing arts much more accessible to the public. And there was a real understanding that um, the, the educational and cultural level of the people need to, needed to, to be changed. In 1961, Fidel Castro announced at the United Nations that he was going to eradicate illiteracy from the population within a year. This became known, known as the Literacy Campaign, and it saw many university students going out into the countryside, armed with giant pencils and uh, exercise books and textbooks, trying to teach the illiterate population to read. A similar thing happened in the cultural field, and groups of amateur artists were set up all over the island. At uh, its heyday, this programme had around a million amateur artists in a population of six or seven million people. And this continues to this day. There are houses of culture in each of the, the small towns around the island where people can learn to paint or draw or play a musical instrument after school or after work. At the same time, uh, professional arts education has, has come on leaps and bounds and a national art school was set up in the grounds of a requisitioned country club. Film was recognised as a revolutionary medium and uh, an institute for film was set up just a couple of months after the revolution triumphed. They were also responsible for um, renovating cinemas, which they did enthusiastically, and uh, built a couple of new cinemas and uh, instigated a mobile cinema programme, which took film around the island on the back of a lorry or uh, even drawn by donkey at some point places uh, or on a boat in parts of the coast that were inaccessible by land. The Film Institute commissioned films so it made educational films about the rapid progress that was being made around land redistribution and so on and eventually this evolved into more narrative films which Cuba has become well known for in recent years. A parallel movement was the the poster movement uh, which was set up to promote the films uh, a silk screen industry um, was developed to produce these very uh, lyrical posters which were a complete departure from the very glossy Hollywood posters that we're familiar with. There was no um, prioritisation of the central characters of the film or any kind of star system. The, uh, instead, the posters encapsulate the essential message of the film and are much more around, around that than, than promoting any particular egos. Um, policy, cultural policy, was developed at the same time as practice and it was very much developed by artists and writers themselves at various congresses and conferences that were held in the early 1960s. There were grants instigated for production and living costs and a union was set up for artists and writers. At around this time, copyright was suspended and um, cheap copies of, of international paperbacks flooded the market very, very cheaply. And a similar thing happened in the art world, so the market for con commercial art was suspended and instead artists were paid by the state to produce their work and contributed to the state by um, through their teaching efforts and through their graphic design or, or other work. Of course it wasn't all plain sailing and there were various different factions that existed within the revolution. The 26th of July movement was uh, really a, a, a struggle for national um, liberation. It wasn't particularly ideological. Uh, there was a, a very strong um, communist movement there at the same time which uh, perpetuated the orthodox uh, tenets of Marxism uh, but it was um, c connected to um, international movements rather than um, national struggle and was very far behind when it came to calling for the revolution. In fact the, um, the orthodox Marxist only joined the revolution a few few months before it triumphed.
So this created a, a, a clash within uh, the cultural policy of the revolution with different sides striving for their voices to be heard. Um, this ultimately led to a, a, a dark period during the 1970s where the orthodox Marxists came to the fore and stifled um, creative practice to a certain degree through their control of, of the grant system and so on, and various artists were isolated during this period. But the more radical artists among them, and particularly visual artists, perpetuated the idea of international solidarity and um, brought to the fore the idea that artists had a role, and art itself had a role, in revolutionary struggle throughout the Latin American continent. And during the 1970s, one of the most pioneering um, institutions, which was set up by a, a friend of Fidel Castro, Aide Santa Maria, the, the organization was uh, called um, the House of the Americas. Uh, this organized a, a series of, of meetings between Latin American artists during which they could articulate their role in revolutionary struggle. Ultimately, the dark days began to end around the 1970s, uh, the mid-1970s, through the appointment of a new Minister of Culture, Armando Hart, who had been the first Minister of Education and had a very good relationship with the artistic community. Uh, and so the, the cultural policy that we see today in, in Cuba is very much um, around the, the central tenets that were developed during the early 60s, around a very non-elitist form of cultural access, around everybody having access to their own creativity and around uh, artists being recognised as an integral member of society and rewarded for their work. So I wrote a book about all of this. Uh, if anybody's interested, you can read more about the characters that were, that were involved in developing all of these ideas. And when I came back to the UK, I looked around to try and find a parallel or something similar that might exist outside of the uh, commercial art world and I stumbled upon uh, an arts and health movement that I wasn't aware of previously. There are many, many people around the country, the whole of the UK, who are, what, are working at the intersection between arts, health and well-being, offering creative activity to people who might need this for the benefit of their health. And there's an incredible amount of evidence that's building up now to show just how good for our health it is to engage with the arts and creativity. In fact, I would go so far to say as to say that um, this can have a role in tackling the injustices and the inequalities that we see in our society. And I worked with an all-party parliamentary group to bring this to light within our culture. I wrote a comprehensive report over a couple of years um, looking at the findings of, of extensive research in this area. If anybody's interested, let me know and I can send you a copy. More recently, I've been looking specifically about uh, at the role of the arts in creative ageing for the Bering Foundation. So uh, within our culture, there are there is recognition that the arts are good for more than just economic value. There is actually an individual and social value that we can articulate for the arts and culture. So as I mentioned, I was working in Parliament and um, the general election that we have upon us now has been in the air for quite some time. Where I live in, in South Thanet, on the coast of the southeast of England, uh, which infamously was contested by Nigel Farage in 2015, there was a discussion around who might stand as the Labour Party's candidate for the general election when it came. Um, various people suggested to me that it might be an idea for me to put myself forward because I had a history of analysing policy, policy and legislation and it might be an idea to actually start formulating some of this rather than researching that which had been drawn up by other people. So I threw my hat in the ring a couple of years ago and I was fortunately selected as the parliamentary candidate for South Thanet, which is why I can't be here with you today. I'm uh, in the middle of contesting a general election campaign and uh, any minute now I need to go off and canvass in one of the poorest wards in our constituency. Um, I am hoping to be elected as an MP who will have knowledge not only of inequality, but also health, well-being, the arts and culture. Uh, so uh, keep your fingers crossed and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks again for inviting me. Many thanks. Bye-bye.